On today's episode of The Finish Line, I'll be joined by Richman Webb as we run it dual style. And we are going to be talking about the Miami Dolphins potentially revealing their draft strategy to a free agent. Also, on top of that, is Chris Greer gaining more power throughout the NFL? We'll talk about how the Dolphins are setting trends offensively. Man, we got a lot to talk about. It's it's the return of the finish line sans ball game for the first time in a few weeks. So do us the favor, smash the like button, subscribe if you're new. We just hit 15K. Appreciate all y'all. Let's get into this. You have got to be kidding me. Jalen Waddle has a dolphin touchdown. And he will score. Huddle up, huddle up. We're gonna crank these engines up on one, on one. All right. What did he? What is it? Drivers, start your engines. This is the finish line. I approached a great offensive line in the past. Larry Little, Dwight Stevenson, Jim Langer, all Hall of Famers, and Richmond Webb belongs in that same group. Here are your hosts, legendary Miami Dolphins left tackle Richmond Webb, Reason, and Mr. Ballgame. What is good, Fin Nation? What's good? It's your boy Reason, and we are back here for another one. Before we get into it, you heard me right, and I want to shout each and every one of you out. We just surpassed 15K subscribers on the channel, so stay locked in as I'll be announcing a giveaway sooner rather than later. And Richmond, we are back minus ball game for the first time in a few weeks. How are you feeling? We haven't really, you know, had a chance to talk publicly about free agency, Odell Beckham Jr., you know, your thoughts on how this team is shaping up. Because I don't know if you saw my show yesterday, but Vegas has our win total 10 and a half heading into the season, where last year it was only nine and a half with Christian Wilkins, Xavier Howard, and such on the roster. How are you feeling as this roster shapes up? How are you feeling with some of the players that departed? And how are you feeling about the potential addition of an Odell Beckham Jr.? Hey, everyone. Uh, good evening, Reed. Hey, uh, man, I'm feeling good. It's good to be back on the show with you. And first off, let me say congratulations on that 15K. That's amazing. Uh, Thank you. Keep hitting that, hitting that trend line and trajectory. Keep going. But, um, man, uh, to be honest, uh, reason, man, I think we've been more uh, active in free agents that, than what I participated or expected because, you know, going into free agency, we had some issues as far as the cap and this and that. And then, like you said, there were players that was affecting, um, like you said, Wilkins, uh, Connor Williams, Robert Hunt, 
wanted to keep. And I think we had tried to work out some things. With people. Um, I think the one that kind of caught everybody off guard was Will to the Raiders. And uh, for the amount of money he got, you know, I'm happy for him. Um, congratulate that young man on that for success because he put it on the field, you know, for the Dolphins, you know, in and out. It just money wise, it didn't work out for us, but, you know, the Raiders are getting a really good player. So I'm happy for him and, and continue success. And, but some kind of way we, I don't know all the exacts, but we freed up money and we have been really active and aggressive. And so far I've really liked everything that the Dolphins have done. I did see the other day about o Odell Beckham, you know, coming in, bringing him in for a visit to Snat. Uh, I think he would definitely be a great addition with Waddle and uh, Tyreek. You know, he could he could really eat in that slot position. So, um, again, I, I think they're really attacking it in free agency. I think, you know, a lot of times people think you got to always go after the big names and this and that, but I think they're studying ad adding – depth quality players but at a value to where it fits within the cap and it doesn't just throw things out and i think you know chris greer's done a really good job and i think you know based on like with wilkins Hunt, connor williams guys like that he's probably saying you know maybe let's try to get ahead of some of this but i think he's done uh outstanding job so far and I'm trying to remember. Did you ask me something else? I'm trying to. Uh... No, that no, you pretty you pretty much covered it actually. To be okay. honest with you. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. Good job, so, bro. I'm, I'm trying to have a, a plus plus you, for an effort. I got, oh, I got pressed on me. I'm, I'm on by myself with you now, so I got to step my game. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the pressure cooker. Um, <laughs> let me ask you this. Um, now I had a uh, part of my report. Uh, you know, I had a, a update on, you know, um, Patreon and and, cha and for channel members here. I'm not going to go into specifics for everyone because, you know, hey, I want people to sign up. But let me ask you this. Um, if you were a, you know, because you've played, obviously, you know, star should be Hall of Fame left tackle. Um, okay. So that's not really a position. But let's say you let, – let's shift and let's say because you were around them. Let's say you were a, a – star should be hall of fame or wide receiver that was your career if you were tyreek yeah yeah if you were tyreek hill mm -hmm. in that position or jalen waddle you know or you were tyreek hill and you had a jalen waddle or you're jalen wall and had a tyreek hill how would you feel about bringing in another talent the level of obj would you feel threatened or would you embrace it, it because he's a guy who obviously believes he's a number one still Right, there's no doubt about that. He believes he's a number one and can still compete at a number one level. I know you wouldn't bring in a left tackle to compete with you because that just wouldn't make sense. But that's why I'm giving you this option. How, like, as a former professional NFL player, how would you feel with with someone like that coming in the room? Well, I, I look at it this way, and you bring up a great point. Um, when I look at Odell Beckham Jr., I, I think he could be one, definitely a two. Um, number two receiver in this league. I think he still has a skill set. He's had a couple of injuries, but when you when you go into a situation where you got a Tyree Kill and you got an up and coming Jaden Waddle, I think you understand that you're going to be the number three guy. I think what you look at as far as the Odell Beckham from his viewpoint, I look at it and say, okay, I can still really eat in this offense at the third slot. And then what you got to look at is sometimes injuries happen. And if if Tyreek goes down for a couple of weeks or Waddle, you can move into that position and you can still, you know, you bring so much value to the team that I think, you know, I think that's the way that um, Odell, Odell Beckham looks at it. As far as Waddle and um, Tyreek, I don't think they really look at him as a threat. I think Tyreek knows he's the guy, like you said, and I think you covered, he has another year or two and then the Dolphins are going to have to make a decision. Yeah, but um, I, I think he he welcomes it because if you got three guys like that on the field, it really puts a lot of pressure on the defense that either he's going to get it, is it, you can spread the ball around, and versus you know that that helps take double coverage off a guy like Tyreek. So it's all in how you process it. I think the way that Tyreek Hill, his work ethic, and all that way he's on the field, he's a natural leader. 
that he shouldn't be, um, I don't think, intimidated or whatever by that because he's still our number one receiver. So long as you're in that spot, I don't think I would look at it and say uh, they're bringing Odell in to, to replace me anything unless – I had a large cap number and I wasn't willing to rework my deal or something like that. I think he's another yeah. year or two from that. So he should be fine with it, but that would be a huge addition, man, to that. And I it'd be hard to pass up if I was, you know, Odell. I know he's been around a few places and a lot of teams still have interest and stuff, but this would be definitely a place that I would really be considering as home. It's warm. He already likes hanging out in Miami, this and that. So there's yeah. a lot of pluses here. No state taxes. So why'd you have to bring yeah. up the yacht story from New York, bro? <laughs> guy, like, he already likes hanging out of Miami. We know. I almost brought it up. I almost. <laughs> I, said, nah, nah, nah. I ain't gonna tell my man Nick. I'm gonna do that. So that's funny. Um, because you know, my whole thing with um, with you know OBJ as well is it's kind of what you alluded to there about you know the injury and stepping up and you'll still be able to eat with those guys. He's got to look at himself as more of a mercenary right now in the sense of, you know, I think the only other place that could give him a chance to get his bag up would be Kansas City, who just cleared all that cap space, right? Because, you know, he'd be in there with like Rasheed Rice and um, and such, you know what I mean? So I, I think that's a chance. But, yeah, you're right. I think we are like, you know, one one of two des I really look at us or KC as the best option for him in terms of if he wants to get his bag up for another contract after the fact, right? So yeah. um Jason Myers says, Congrats on 15k. What's up, fellas? Appreciate you. What's up, Jay? Um, Jason, thank you very much, sir. Um, all right, let's uh let's hop into this because we got a couple things we want to talk about tonight. Um, and, and let's start off with this and the title of this show right here about how the Miami Dolphins, they might have revealed their potential draft strategy um, and they might have done it to a free agent. So let's let's go over this here because this just screams draft, draft, draft. I mean, it's something I've talked about on this channel. Dolphins conveyed to at least one veteran free agent starting guard that they'll check in with him after the draft, potentially, if they are still looking for one. Meanwhile, Jeff Davian Clowney, well out of Miami's price range, joins Carolina. Search for edge rusher depth continues. I mean, uh, they're telling free agents flat out, yeah, sit tight until after the draft. I mean, what does that tell you? That tells you that offensive line is high on the list heading into the draft. And that's basically saying, well, you know, we only have a, a pick at 21 and 55, and then we don't pick till the fifth round. If the board don't fall our way, we'll give you a call. That's what I, the, that's what I take from that. And, you know, when you look at what they could do with offensive line there, you know, at 21, I think you got tackle and play, you know, you got a guy like Troy fought new from Washington who has the ability to kick out at left tackle, but could also be one of the better guards in the league in a couple of years, if you give him the time there, you got a kid, he ended up not testing, but, and people are wondering if it's because of his off season, uh, training regimen, if they must've learned his athletic testing wouldn't have been good enough. JC Latham, the tackle from Alabama, right? That's another guy who can play right tackle, could play right guard, or you could do what, you know, the Cleveland Brown did with Jedrick Wills when they drafted him out of Alabama. He's playing right tackle. Let's kick him the left tackle. Right, you know how it works. If you're athletic enough and you got a you got a high IQ up here, you can kick over, right? So, and then I think at 55, you know, and, and I've been trying to talk about this, uh, Richmond, and you know, food for thought for you because I don't know if you've heard me say this. You know, I, I know the fan base is really high on Jackson Powers Johnson, that center from Oregon that everyone wants to stick that can also play guard. Mm -hmm. Chris Greer does not draft interior lineman in the first round he drafts premium positions tackle edge corner he drafts premium positions especially with that pick that's why i say a tackle that can play guard and then kick back out when armstead leaves that makes sense but when you talk about 55 yeah. all the cards are on the table when you get to a, a 55 i'm a huge guy i'll send you some film of these guys when i do my board and stuff but i'm a huge fan of christian haynes from yukon i'm a i'm a huge fan zach center from um michigan but he uh broke his fibula and tibula so he's healing 
Um, you know, and then there's guys like Christian Mahogany and 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 C Cooper Bebe and so on and so forth. But my whole point is 21, you got to think premium position. What does that tell you? Tackle that could play guard. And 55 is where interior is fully on the board for me. Um, what are your thoughts on reading that quote? Do you get the same kind of vibe? Because I've been saying, Richmond, you know, it they brought back Isaiah Wynn. Okay, they mm -hmm. they've got Eichenberg. They signed Aaron Brewer. They signed Jack Driscoll, who's a utility guy, right? He could play tackle, play guard. There was no way they were going into this season with that interior. You got Aaron Brewer's the really only certainty. Isaiah wins a certainty at left guard, but his health hasn't been a certainty for his whole career. And then at right guard, a battle between Liam Eichenberg, Jack Driscoll, and Robert Jones isn't exactly the most ideal replacement for the mauler that was Robert Hunt. So I've been saying to people, there's just no way that, that, that they're going into the season with that interior. What What are your thoughts when, when you take that into account and when you read that quote? Well, I, I, I think you read it right. Anytime an organization, knowing they, they have a need at a certain position and then they have quality free agents out there and they say, well, not right now, but we're going to see what we can get in the draft. To me, that says the same thing. That says to me that it's enough quality players in the draft that even if you take our first, second guy, we can still get somebody. And it makes perfect sense. Um, I think Teron said, said he's coming back for another year, so they restructured his deal. So you said it, left tackle. Like you said, if you take one of those tackles, you can you can kick in the guard for a year or two. Let him learn up under a Toronto Armstead or something, and then move him out a year or two later. It makes perfect sense, and um, it could be one of those Richmond Webb Keith Sim drafts. I don't know. <laughs> it, it would be bad. It, it would be bad. You know, I think this is. Uh, it's been a while. I, I think was it Billy Milner and Andrew Green? Maybe in '95. Maybe they did something like that. But normally, it's been a while since they've taking, you know, uh, two linemen in the first two rounds. So that's the first thing I started talking, thinking about when you were talking about this. Mm. And uh, it makes sense. And then, like you said, most of the time you're right. Not only Chris Greer, but most GMs don't take centers in the first round. It's You know, they might take a guard, but a guy like that, you normally can get in the second, third round and yeah. still get a really quality, good player. It's not, so it, it makes perfect sense, but um, like I said, Nathan or some of the other gentlemen you brought, you can you can slide that guy in for a year or two. And I think the other thing I was thinking about too was the injuries we had in the interior line and how it really affected our running game during the season. Not only were you paying attention to that, I think the Dolphins were, and that's why you're saying it doesn't make sense. Um, I even heard about Connor Williams, his agent, that injury is a lot more serious than what yeah. I think a lot of people expected. So, yeah, you know, and I've even heard, I think somebody said somebody, he might even think about retirement. So you got to really stiffen up, up. And I, I think they pay attention to saying, look, this really hindered our offensive performance at times when we had all those in injuries in the in interior of our offensive line. So, um, like you said, they signed win and stuff, but um, they're going to want to, upgrade that so yeah i think it's enough guys quality guys that they feel they can get a guy in the first round and second round i don't know but i would love it if they took two linemen that would be you know another lineman's dream but um when they, well, when they, tell out for them, when they like did that, it with you and sims man i mean like look out. at you right i mean you were a seven-time pro bowler two time second team all pro two-time first team all pro and Keith Sims with a with one time second team all pro and three time Pro Bowlers. There's 10 Pro Bowls yeah. between the two of you, right? And yeah. you know, you went at nine and he went 30 picks after you, right? He went at 39 yeah. in the second round. Yeah. And I know it's not sexy to everyone, you know, it's not the sexy, but when you know, if you build a line like what we had for a decade with you guys in front of Marino, that was sexy. When it for football nerds and football talk and offensive line fans. That was sexy, right? That offensive line. So, you know, it, it's just all about the – and you know what? Honestly, like you said, Richmond, I wouldn't be mad. It, you know, if they turned around and they a tackle fell in their lap at 21 and then, yeah. you know, one of those high-caliber guards was sitting there at 55 and they just said, screw it, pull the trigger. I, I mean, you know, 
you're not going to hear a complaint from me because, you know, especially when you're about to pony up 50 plus million a year to your quarterback and he becomes the most valuable asset financially on your team. Yeah. Invest the assets that you have to protect that investment. I always say this to people, right? Like Richmond, if I gave you a, like, let's say I gave you $10 million, right? Okay. You're not going to put it in a shoebox in your closet, right? You're going to go get a safe, or you're going to go put it in a bank that will securely protect your money. You got to treat a quarterback the same way if you're paying them fifty million dollars. Like you got to, you got to, you got to put that, put them in that vault and protect them as much as possible. You 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 want some return on your investment, and you know the other thing I was sitting here thinking about too, which makes sense. Like what you were saying is, I just thought about it. Except the only thing, Austin Jackson was a little younger. You know, he I thought he was just a little younger, but he had the athletic ability. But imagine bringing in a, a young tackle or whatever, moving him to guard with the offensive line coach that we have now yeah. to really develop him. I, I think I think um, I think Austin Jackson would have benefited from that as well. We got one of the best line coaches in the league, so it it makes perfect sense. And and, and I was just sitting there thinking about that. I, I said, yeah, we took a. And now everybody is raving about Austin Jackson because he got beat up those first. You know, a few years, but everybody love him now and all that. So that's that's a good thing. Yeah, I mean, like the, you know, you said it. I mean, Butch Berry and the work he did last year with Frank Smith and Mike McDaniel, that offensive line, you know, and that's where I think a little, you know, I mean, you've been around coaches, right? You know, everyone talks about players' arrogance, but no one other than, you know, you know, me and Ball game really talk about coach arrogance, which you see it. And these guys have the right to be a little arrogant where they can sit on their hands and they can let the, the linemen come to them instead of going out and turning over every rock and stone to find that lineman because they believe in their ability to develop and grow. And, you know, that that's a strength. And they showed it in year one, and they've gained all of our confidence with what we saw. I mean, look at what they did with Eichenberg. Never mind Austin Jackson. We knew in this system Jackson had the physical traits that Mike McDaniel were going to make work. It was Eichenberg where we're like, this guy's got no anchor. He's got T-Rex arms, right? He, he, he doesn't, you know, he doesn't move very well, whether it's laterally or in space. And then you saw what he did last year. And sure. W w w did he look like a bonafide starter? No, but he looked like he was growing into a decent backup option. A guy you would be okay with playing two or three games a year. You know what I mean? Not a guy you want out there for the full 17 season right now at this stage, but he was turning a corner. He, you know, he put his best reps on tape that he had in his whole Dolphins tenure last year. So that alone, if that doesn't perk your ear up, I mean, I don't know what will, right? So. Yeah. yeah. It's, and, and the other thing I was sitting here thinking about too is reason. I, I can remember a time where, you know, you got the weather, you got everything in Miami, but it was at one point in time where free agents really didn't really consider coming to, to Miami. And, and now that's changing. So they're doing something right in order for guys even to consider going here or for them to be able to tell a guy, hey, we'll contact you after the draft, this and that. And and some guys are going to wait because everybody's not going to get signed before the draft. And, and, and they look and they say, okay, if that doesn't work out, I still got opportunity to go down there and, and play. And so that, that speaks volumes to me. I, it's the little things that sometimes it's not that you kind of look back and reflect and say, oh, yeah, I remember a few years back, nobody wanted to come to Miami. And that was one of the things people couldn't understand why. Yeah. And, you know, like going back to Odell for a sec on that point you just made, if I would have told you five or six years ago, Odell would be willing to come here as a wide receiver three, you'd have looked at me funny and been like, there ain't no snowball chance in hell. And you know, he still believes he's a, he can produce as a number one on another team, but he's considering it not only because of with the location and the teammates, but I mean, you know, you saw the NFL PA report cards. We were basically yeah. the number one franchise in the, you know, voted on by the NFL PA in all of our facilities, how we, how we treat players and their family and stuff. And I mean, we don't got to worry about treating OBJ's family because he heard that Kim Kardashian was doing her around saying she wanted to start a family with him and dumped her the next day. So <laughs> we don't got to worry about that in Miami. Huh? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> it is what it is, man. It is what it is. And there's a kid I'm going to send you film on because I don't know if you've had a chance. You've probably watched him because SEC and New Texas A&M. And Daddy Dean mentions him, Barton, Mims, or Fadnu. 
Amarius Mims. I'll send you some stuff on him. You got to watch him. Um, okay. He's he's a tackle from Georgia. I'm telling you. I, I'm telling you live on air before I send you this stuff. Yeah. When you watch him, you're going to be like, and and think about Austin Jackson, and you're going to watch him, and you're going to be like, yeah, Chris Greer. <laughs> like, that's what okay. you're going to say to yourself. Like, it's going to scream. You know, your inner voice is going to be screaming Chris Greer, and it's going to cause you to say to yourself, yeah, Chris Greer. Like when you watch this kid, so I'll send you some stuff on him so you can see what I'm talking about. Um, because I get your cosign, um, then I want I want to uh, uh, you know I want that for the people. So let's keep it going here. Um, interesting article here from Pro Football Network and Adam Beasley, and we'll go over it here. And it says Miami Dolphins Chris Greer quietly has helped change the NFL in a big way. NFL ownership overwhelmingly voted Tuesday to approve a one-year trial run of an NXFL-style kickoff format, handing the league's eight-person competition committee its biggest win of the week. Sharing in that victory, someone who I was asking everyone, where is he? I, I haven't seen him in pictures. Well, Dolphins general manager Chris Greer, who for the past couple of years has quietly helped rewrite the league's playbook as one of those eight committee members. Also, Chris Greer is the lone GM on the committee. He currently serves with Falcon CEO Rich McKay, Bengals EVP Katie Blackburn, Cowboys COO Stephen Jones, Giants CEO John Mara, Bills coach Sean McDermott, Rams coach Sean McVay, and Steelers coach Mike Tomlin. Together, they proposed six rule changes this year with the kickoff overhaul, the highest profile. Acting on advice of the NFL's top special teams coaches, the committee sold the owners on a plan that drastically changed the kickoff while still being mindful of player safety. But unlike many of his colleagues on the committee who publicly advocated for the change at the NFL's annual league meeting this week, Greer has characteristically kept a low profile. When it comes to his responsibilities on the committee and with the Dolphins, Greer much prefers to do his work behind the scenes. Greer, whose father, Bobby, was a longtime personal executive with the pa uh, Patriots, and by the way, his brother is the general manager of the San Jose Sharks in the NHL, instinctively... Oh instinctually defers the spotlight to others, McDaniel, when it comes to the Dolphins, and McKay regarding committee work. Behind closed doors, Greer has become more and more comfortable speaking his mind. So let's talk about this here. Um, you know, is Greer gaining more power around the league? Like, and I don't mean that, you know, you, 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 know, you look at the thumbnail and my, uh, my thumb guy, put Thanos's, you know, glove with the stones on Chris Greer in the, in the uh in the thumbnail, but I mean, he's the only GM on this committee that's actually changing the rule book and the playbook of the NFL. You know, you see the names he's tied to. He's out there with with CEOs and some of the top coaches in the NFL. You know, we know he's well liked in the building. You know, I, I ask if he's gaining power, Richmond, because when you see that influence, when you see that level of respect, I thought to myself, man, even if we flop this year, there ain't no way they're firing him, huh? <laughs> like that's that's what I said to myself. I'm like, man, I don't like it seems like league wide, even if we did fire him, he'd have a job in a second. What what are your thoughts on that level of respect and that level of power that Chris Greer is beginning to wield throughout the NFL? Because you know what? Chris Greer matters in the NFL landscape right now outside of the Miami Dolphins, which not a lot of GMs can say. Yeah, I, I think the thing that, that we as Dolphin fans, we we don't realize is that, you know, this ain't his first rodeo. He's He's been around the league. And like you say, his dad's worked in the league. And uh, for him to be appointed to this committee with the people that's on that committee, I'm like Stephen Jones, that's Jerry Jones' son, Katie Blackburn. Um, that's the daughter of the uh, um, owner of the Cincinnati Bengals. She was there when I was there, but um, CEO of the Atlanta Falcons. I'm reading all these names, and for you to be sitting at the table with people like that, and and they're being a, they're willing to listen to your input and stuff like that, it just shows that he is very well respected around the league. I think. Uh, sometimes we as Dolphin fans, we look back and we're not happy with some of the draft picks he's made early on, this and that. And so uh, <laughs> I think somebody put out an article on Chris Greer on Twitter the other day. And, and, you know, as Dolphin fans, a lot of them, not all of them, but a lot of them, they, they can't let go of it and say, 
you know, he needs to be fired. He needs to be fired. This and that. But like you said, he's well respected around the league. And like you said, he's well respected in the in 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 the in the Dolphins facility in, in that office. So uh, he's doing something right, whether the owner likes him or whatever. I don't see him going anywhere in the last few drafts. He's, he's done a pretty good job. And um, even when you watch him during interviews, he's kind of more reserved. He answers questions, but you got to kind of pick to it. He'll refer more to Mike McDaniel, push him out there, give him credit, you know, this and that. And he kind of answers what you ask, but um, he's, he's secretly kind of making boss moves behind the scenes. And he, I think he just prefers to move in silence. But um, when you're respected, you ain't always got to toot your own horn and say, well, I did this. I did that. That's that's not him. And I think it's working really well for him and for him to be on that on that committee. And I think he said it changed like six rules or whatever. So uh, definitely he, he's a man of influence. I mean, we might get pissed off at him at times because the Dolphins are not doing or performing or getting some of the players that we want him to get or whatever. But no, I believe he is very well respected. And when you read articles like that, you start finding out information that typically you wouldn't know. And for that to be brought to light, I say, oh, yeah, it, it gave me a whole different perspective on Chris Greer. But, yeah, he is he is very well respected. And when you are, when you say people, what you say people listening to him, for you to have a seat at the table with those type of people, yeah, he, he's he's got some juice for sure. And I got to say this, you know, his brother – you know, his brother played for the Sharks before he became uh, the first black general manager in the NHL. You look at what well, his dad was a hockey player. He was a hockey player that. first, and then he became that. the first yeah. black general manager in the NHL. And you look at what Chris Greer is doing, and then you look at his dad, Bobby, and what his dad – like, that is a – that is a business side of the sports bloodline, eh? Like, that is yeah. – you know, and, and it's not like – you know, it's one thing to open doors for Chris, you know, Bobby Career to open doors for Chris Greer in the NFL, but Mike Greer's been knocking down barriers in the National Hockey League, and that just goes to show how strong and really, you know, how 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 strong and how great that bloodline is from a business side. You know what I mean? So. Yeah. You know, very rarely do you get that. You know what I mean? Usually everyone's connected in the same league. But to branch out as an African-American to be as successful in the National Hockey League as Mike Greer has been shows how special that family really is. You know what I mean? So, yeah, he's, um, he's, probably, had a, he's probably had a much tougher path. You know, the, the thing with, with Chris, his dad was here. So a lot of people give you opportunities, you know, because his dad has worked around the league and stuff. But like I said, just playing hockey and, and – breaking in the door and a lot of times very few I'm, I'm gonna say as far as nfl very few nfl players they'll get to work they'll get to go into coaching and stuff but very few actually move into the front office yeah. a lot of those those positions stuff like that so that definitely probably helped chris but for his brother to break into hockey this and that he probably had to do a lot of that on his own so like you say they, that family is very well respected yeah, I mean, and, and you know, it, it's it just goes off of, you know, what you just said. I mean, who else could we name really right now? John Lynch. Yeah. You know, like Ozzie Newsom played, right? He did, but that was a long time. It, yeah, that was a long time names. ago. That was a long time. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So. But I mean, you know, it's very few. But what's crazy is, look how brilliant is John Lynch. How brilliant yeah. is Ozzy Newsome? Well, I mean, Ozzy yeah. Newsome to me, I'd still back the bring trucks up and tell him to come and be an advisor <laughs> here. You know what I mean? I mean, that guy just knows how to. That guy just, that yeah. guy built not only a winning culture, but a culture, one of the best drafting cultures in the NFL. You know, like Ozzy Newsome built something special in Baltimore, man. He built yeah. a blueprint they could follow for like, you know, decades, really. So, I'm, I'm, a, I'm everyone knows I'm a huge fan of him. So um, shout out to ball game. He's in the chat right now and um, he's throwing excuses around. He's saying, sorry for my absence folks. It's no, track season. Uh -huh. And I made a commitment to these kids that I can't walk away from right now. Miss you all. And I'll be back soon. No one's asking you to walk away, bro. You're in track and field. <laughs> run baby. Run. It's track and field. Run. <laughs> Pass that baton. Um, Stick. Yeah. We're going to change. Come on ball game. Hmm. <laughs> 
Oh, uh-huh, man. Shout out to ball game because I know if I was, you know, hooked up with track and field and these people were telling me, you know, we'd be running track at 730 at night. I'd be looking at them funny being like, yo, what? are Nah, man, we running this at four o'clock after school's done is what I'd be saying. So shout out to ball game, man, for putting in the work yeah. and helping the next generation of track stars and athletes in the Florida region, man. Appreciate his hard work and his great work, man. Volunteering your time and dedicating your time to growing and developing the youth. There's not many more special things you can do with your time than that. So shout out to Mr. Ball Game. All right. Let's go on into here about how we're just going to – it's a long article, so I'm going to read a portion of it. But oh, this is a very interesting article that I recommend everyone take the time out to go read on The Athletic. All right? <laughs> And this is going to show y'all how big of a trend the Miami Dolphins set last year, okay? How one motion play swept through the NFL in 2023. Quote, everybody is copying it. It didn't take longer than a week or two for the idea of a to proliferate across the league. Early in the second quarter of their week one game against the Los Angeles Chargers, Miami Dolphins head coach Mike McDaniel called a short out motion to set up a 28-yard catch for receiver Tyree Kill. The motion element of the play was new to many, a truncated version of a longer developing pre-snap jet motion that features a player running behind and across the formation before he bursts up the field at the snap. This short motion sent Hill outward, not inside or across, after a signal from the quarterback. He then turned to run vertically at the snap of the ball instead of having to first get across the formation, sprinting about 15 yards downfield before breaking inward for the catch in the middle of the field. The motion spread rapidly across the NFL at first and especially among the coaching family to which McDaniel belongs. The Rams under coach uh, uh, Sean McVay started running these motions by week two in a game against the San Fran 49ers coached by Kyle Shanahan and vice versa. Zach Taylor's Bengals ran it by week three. By midseason, the Green Bay Packers with Matt LaFleur used the concept against the Rams. Current Falcons head coach Raheem Morris, a former colleague of all of them, joked in November that McDaniel, Shanahan, McVay would have to fight over credit for the concept's inception as quickly as it blazed into a league-wide trend. At the end of the 2023 season, some version of the short-out motion was in the playbooks of most, if not all, teams that frequently utilize pre-snap motion. We call it cheat because it's cheating, Shanahan said in September. It's cool to get them running sideways and still hit it vertically. In football, ideas form in one building, are bored by another, and continue to evolve based on a team's personnel and staff. Some concepts are solved by scheme. Others are unsolvable because of the abilities of the players who run them. With the help of technology and a generation of coaches and players driven toward innovation, that cycle happens faster than ever. Hill's speed brought Miami's version of cheat to life. He could run any type of route out of it, including the inbreakers that capitalized on recently vacated space in the middle of the field. Nobody else had Hill, but everybody else wanted to see if they could apply the motion and variations of it to players with different skill sets. Even players with out of lead speed could get open off the line of scrimmage when running this short motion because it can open up space behind another offensive player, a rub, right? Nearly simultaneously with the snap. Meanwhile, defensive coaches agonize over ways to stop it. When reporters asked McDaniel where he came up with the motion in September, he told them he was just bored. <laughs> <laughs> the real answer is more layered. The Dolphins passing attack is predicated on timing and the elite speed possessed by Hill and fellow receiver Jalen Waddle means even deeper route concepts have quick throw potential. See guys, this is why a Michael Penix and a Justin Fields won't work. They can't make these timing throws. Quarterback Tua Tungvaloa's average time to throw last season was a league fast at 2.36 seconds according to next-gen stats. Yeah, Miami's offense Ranked second in pass yards per attempt. No screens on this side for the majority. Defenses worked to contain the Dolphins' explosive passing attack in different ways. Some tried jamming Hill off the line to disrupt or delay his timing or using other techniques to try and move receivers off their route patterns and landmarks. Some teams put a wide, hard-to-navigate shell over the defensive backfield and hoped they could harass Tongue of a Low with only four pass rushers or force him to make shorter completions under the shell. <laughs> Miami, like other teams across the NFL, already deployed jet motions. Using different cadences, calls, and signals, Tungvaloa could time the snap so the player in motion could cut upfield and get space off the line of scrimmage, as well as a head start into running full speed. But those motions ultimately require players to cover a significant amount of horizontal yardage before their routes even begin. Every offensive playbook contains at least one form of pre- and at-snap motion, 
the use of which especially increased over the last seven years. 17 of the NFL's 32 teams utilized motion on at least 50% of the offensive snaps in 2023. ESPN analytics found with some of the league's top offenses, the Dolphins, the Ravens, the 49ers, the Chiefs, the Packers, and Detroit Lions using it most frequently. And you see here, look at the motion. Miami motioned 82.8% of their snaps. Number two was the Niners at 75.4. Number three was the Rams at 70.4. And what's the correlation? Shanahan tree right there leading the way, right? Number four, Kansas City Chiefs. Number five, another Shanahan off put, Green Bay, right? So at 64. And then, and then we go down and we go down. And I expect Atlanta to raise this year. Um, but... I mean, that's a lot of motion. Holy jeez, 82.8% of your snaps. <laughs> Simpler motion reveals whether a defense in a, is in a man or zone coverage, but some modern defenses disguise their man zone indicators, thus nullifying the intent of an information gathering motion. More advanced <clears throat> motion create multiple advantages at once, providing information about the defense while also manufacturing leverage in space. For example, the Chiefs' motion combined with a, an RPO helps show a defense's coverage based on a defender's movement. It may also help the quarterback alert to pressure. Most importantly, the motion changes the formation to determine whether the offense will get a numbers advantage against either downfield defenders or a box or box defenders. Patrick Mahomes sees he has one less defender to tie up his receivers if he decides to pass, because that defender shows he will play the run during the pre-snap motion. And listen. This thing goes on and on, and you know, I, I, I implore everyone to do it. And the final quote I'll give you is what Lafleur said in early November. He said, "What Mike Van Daniel has been doing in Miami, everybody is copying it. What the Rams are doing with guys like Puka, they're essentially getting him in a position, and then he becomes a fullback. Yet he might run over deep of you, deep over on you. It definitely has changed the game quite substantially, in my opinion." And remember, LaFleur is one of the top offensive minds in the NFL right now. And he's saying with one simple motion, Mike McDaniel has changed the game substantially. They're finding new ways, and teams are taking that motion, finding new ways to find indicators because you know you got guys like, you know, the Fangio tree, right? Where they don't, they like to hide their disguise till like the very last moment and then show you what they're really doing. Well, you're trying to put those defenses in conflict, so they have to show you their hand, and they can't wait list till the last moment. Listen, we've talked about. I know it came out of um, the owners' meeting this week. Um, you know, he discussed about how McDaniel discussed how he thought long and hard on potentially, you know, giving away play calling to a Frank Smith or someone on the staff, and he said he ultimately decided against it. <coughs> Never been a question about him as a play designer or his playbook. Um, what are your thoughts on this? Because we're only into year two, Richmond, and he's already changing the league. Where are we going to be by year five? And where are we going to be when he catches something that is unique and only we can run with the speed we have and takes even longer for defenses to adapt to it? Because that was what your problem was running into, it, right? When everyone's off copying it offensively, What's the defense of those teams doing? They're learning how to counter it. Um, what are your overall thoughts on that? Because I know it's a lot to digest, but with one motion, Mike McDaniel basically changed the league. Yeah. Um, you know, I think we knew, like, you could even see um, with, with Coach McDaniel from year one to year two, and we talked about, I don't even know if he's even installed all his offense in, in the first two years. So. Yeah. Uh, there's no there's no telling what we're gonna see this year. Um, but one thing I do agree about that that article is it's a copycat league. And if somebody sees it works, everybody starts installing it until somebody figures out how to stop it. This and that. The, the problem with McDaniel is by the time you figure that out, he's added another four or five things that you know he's gonna always keep your head spinning. Um, I think uh he's just a um, he's somebody that studies all the time. He's always looking at film, this and that, and trying to. I don't think his brain slows down, and so that's what he turns on the film and clicks and clicks and clicks and clicks. Yeah. And that's why he comes up with these concepts. And I, I think not only that, I think you're going to start to see other teams kind of copycat how 
our offense is really built on speed at, you know, multiple positions. And I think you, you see if one guy misses a tackle here and there that you have so many players that can give you that big, big playability. Um, as long as they got, you know, they got to be able to play football, but, but speed is something you just can't coach. And if you can get that along with, with some athletic ability, it just, it, it can be a game changer. And like you said, Moser, a Chan, Waddle, Tyreek. Um, <laughs> it's nothing. It's just the way we're building. I, I think you're gonna see other teams start to kind of copy that and, and and this and that. But yeah, he's he's definitely a trendsetter. Um, and then you know maybe the first year you could say yeah he came out from under you know the Shanahan tree and stuff which he did, and I don't think he has a problem um, giving you know the Shanahan's credit this and that because. Everybody's got to learn from somebody, but for he, he's even exceeded as far as the motion. I think that's his baby or thing. He likes to tweak it. So, okay, maybe I can do this. Boom, 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 boom. And like you said, anytime you can force a defense coordinator to show his hand before he wants to, you're putting some major pressure on him. And I think other other teams are watching the film. They're showing, okay, on, but you've got to eventually declare. If not, it's going to really be a mismatch. So, uh, he's doing things to change not only the way offenses are doing it, but the way defenses are going to have to defend him. And um, he's putting that Yale degree to work. I mean, he's probably one of the smartest guys in the league and it's definitely showing. So he's, he's definitely a trend. And I got to go back and read all the article because it, it was some really good. It's a good article. You should read it. Yeah. yeah. It's good this is really long. We'd still be reading it like it's long. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, when they do in-depth pieces like that, you got to give the athletic their props. They they give you a read. They give you like a 10 or 15-minute read, not like a two- or three-minute read. So it's really in-depth. It's a really good article, and it's really done well. Let me ask you this, continuing on this little topic. You know, we've seen over the first two years team records and league records being broke offensively by us. Do you think this is going to be a regular thing every year uh, with McDaniel leading our offense and the innovation he brings to the table as a play designer and such? Uh, no question. I think the thing that you're going to see this year, and, and, and it, it all depends, and I think we saw it affected last year, was injuries, and especially those injuries in the interior offensive line because it affected the way – you were kind of limited in the way you could attack defenses and stuff like that. But if we can keep those interior guys healthy and keep, you know, everybody else healthy, um, I think I think the offense would have been even much more productive if we didn't have the injuries we had at those positions and, and definitely just keeping everybody healthy. Injuries can affect so many things, uh, but I think we saw it developing and then it was like that was the talk most analysts had on Monday, Monday, Tuesday morning. They were talking about the Miami Dolphins and how they did this and how they did that. It's a reason they're talking about that because people hadn't seen the way he was using motion to expose defenses and stuff like that. So, uh, like I say, I'm looking forward to this year because I remember the first year and it, it was a lot more added the second year, you know, adding a player like, you know, HN to the uh, offense. If we add a we add a OBJ or something like that, it's going to be really scary. So I'm just – everything had me settled and checking out this thing. So I'm looking forward. Uh, like I said, Chris Greer's been doing a real good job, and it's a couple people. We signed a, another person here or there. It's, it, could be, it could be really, really scary and really, really happy for our, us Dolphin fans. We just got to stay healthy. That's the key thing. Yeah, if they get that third threat, whether it's a seam option – or another legitimate option, you know, out of the slot who can flex onto the boundary as well, then, you know, I think we're really playing with fire. And, you know, the word out of the, the um, organization is, you know, top brass, not just random scouts, top brass in that organization want a quote-unquote legitimate weapon, at, at, you know, for that third spot. They don't – like they added Jonu Smith, one of the fastest – and, and you know, and, and most explosive tight ends from an after the catch standpoint, and they're still saying, yeah, that's not good enough for a third option. You know, like there's a receiver I love in this uh, draft class. He's my fifth on my board. He's one of my biggest man crushes of this draft. Xavier Leggett out of South Carolina. Okay, he's like six one. All right, he's like two hundred and twenty pounds. 
and he runs a and he runs a four three nine at two twenty. Imagine that coming downhill at you, (laughs) like you know, Olay, you go go ahead, (laughs) sir. You know what I mean. So, um, yeah, there's options in this draft. And then, you know, I know everyone's high on Xavier and Worthy, and I'm sure you saw him when you were watching your college ball. The kid from Texas who ran the 4 2 one My yeah. problem with me is his hands. He, he, he yeah. suffers from big-time concentration drops, and eh, he doesn't have a really expanded route tree. You know what I mean? He just comes off like a slot gadget guy, and that's way too rich for 21. Like, if you're taking a receiver in the first round, especially in the top 25, they need to be somewhat refined, not a project. Yep. You know what I mean? I you take you take more the projects you take are at premium positions. You know what I mean? Yep. Like edge, tackle, you know what I mean? Yep. You you take the you take them there, right? So or corner, right? So um and wide receiver is a premium position, but you you get fired for taking a raw wide receiver, you don't work out. Look at how bad the Titans look trading away AJ Brown and then using the pick to draft Traylon Burks. Traylon, what does Traylon Burks turn out to be while A.J. Brown is out there balling in Philadelphia, right? That's still, why you don't take raw traits at the receiver. Uh, you, like, listen, you you know, if you're a raw route runner, you need to, like, you know, be explosive still when you stem the routes you do run so people see, okay, well, if I just develop his route tree, he'll turn into a good route runner, right? You know, the crispness in and out of your breaks, et cetera, et cetera. You know what I mean? So there's things you can look at with receivers where if you're still raw in certain areas, there's still indicators of, okay, he can still be good at this. Um, so anyways, um, continuing on here and sticking with McDaniel, you know, uh, I, I've been trying to tell people all year, Richmond, and, and you know this, with winning, there's levels to this H- SHIT. All right? It's not, you know... You got to learn to win in the regular season. Then you got to learn to win in the playoffs. You got to learn to win on the road in the playoffs. You got to learn to win big games in the playoffs, i.e., AFC, NFC championships, and Super Bowls. Like, there's levels to this. Like, Burrow hasn't fully mastered all the levels. He's gone to the Super Bowl, but he hasn't won the big one. You know, Matt Pat, you look at the NFL right now, and Patrick Mahomes is the guy who's mastered how to win at all levels. Look at a guy like, uh, you know, um, Lamar Jackson, what is he? Two-time MVP, and in his in his career, he has as many playoff wins as he does MVPs, right? Two, right? So, um, you know, because there's, there's levels to this, right? Um, and this is what Mike McDaniel said today, talking about, you know, uh, let, let me play it, and you guys can see exactly what I'm talking about here, okay? The biggest difference between the 2023 Dolphins and 2024 is what? Well, there's a process that occurs in organizations for winning organizations that you have to go through kind of a, a callous process and every team is different, but with a good amount of players that live through that season, there's a, a badge of honor to really have high expectations, fall short, and then still get the opportunity to make things right. So I think the overall mental fortitude and understanding what it takes to accomplish all the goals that we we all share in, in the springtime, um, that that wisdom and and uh, life experience, I think, will pay dividends for us uh, in in the in the tough times where we'll need to be our best. So he, you know, talk about the cat. You know, you got to go through a callous process. Basically, you got to go through your lumps until you can. <clears throat> overcome them and even alludes to them, you know, like what we've been through the last two years, that's going to help us in those big moments. Um, What are your thoughts about that? I mean, he talked about falling short of expectations. We know the expectations are right back to where they are. He sounds pretty confident, but is, is this turning into, because we kind of got the same message, but different words last year, especially when you watched hard knock, is this turning into one of those things where it's like, okay, we get it. We understand it, but enough talk. It's time to see those. It's, you know, what I'm trying to say is, is it more of a, t- are we in a stage now? Okay. We've heard the talk, but now we want to see how y'all have learned from those lumps and those losses. We don't want to see you keep taking them. We want to see you learn and evolve from them. Are we at that point where it's like, okay, enough saying, you know, adversity is an opportunity and all this jazz. Is it now time to put up and shut up and show us that you've learned from these moments, in your opinion? I, I, I do. And, 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 I, and, and let me kind of expound on that because um, 
I think as players and coaches, um, you're always taught to deal with the hand you dealt. Don't make excuses, this and that. And so the season's over with, this and that. But I just want to revisit some things. And, you know, I've already talked about the injuries in the interior. That definitely affected us. But like you said, you don't make excuses. This is what we got to do. Hey, everybody has it, this and that. Okay. Then you look at, uh, I think we lost Tyreek for a couple games. We lost Waddle for a couple games. And then you go to the defensive side of the ball. X was beat up last year. Um, we lost Jalen Phillips. We lost three pass rushes late in the year where we really need them. I'm not making excuses. I'm just pointing out the facts. Yep. We took it on the chin. We, hey, you, you take your wins like a man. You take your losses like a man. But sometimes you got to go back and reevaluate it and just say, hey, if we don't have certain um, injuries at certain positions or we're a much healthier team, I think we win possibly two, maybe three more games. If you do that, that puts you in a totally different position. Um, you're playing a playoff game at home. Um, you don't you don't go on this slide in December to where everybody is like, you know, what's going on? You're trying to hold it together. So not only do I think McDaniel understands that, I think the players understand that, but they're saying in their head, we're not gonna make excuses, but in your mind, you know, like, man, we was we was better. We just wasn't that full strength when we got hit. And you you, you take your L like a man and you, you you own up to it. But at the same time, I think that's why the expectations are, are what they are. I think, like you told me last year, I think uh, they gave the Dolphins nine and a half games to win. This year we're a game hit. So I think other people are paying attention. It's just that they're not coming out and saying, Oh, the poor Dolphins, this and that. They're like, no, nah, this team stays healthy. If they do what we expect them to do, they're going to be even better than they were the year before. The key thing to do is you got to stay healthy. And I think, you know, like uh, McDaniel, I think he just he thought about giving up the play calling, but that's, that's what he wants to do. And I think he's had some growing pains as well, and I think he's going to do it even better than he did it the first two years. So, I'm expecting growth and and much more productivity from everybody. We just got to stay healthy, and that that's the way I look at it. You know, I wanted to ask you this actually. I, I meant to ask you it earlier in the show, and it slipped my mind. You know, you played in the league for as long as you played in the league. You've watched this team since you've been out of the league for as long as you've watched it. You know, especially over the last couple of years, have you ever seen a team deal with this much injuries in the trenches consecutive, like consistently and consecutively? Like, you know, I know you had an injury while you're in Miami and I know a couple other players, but did you ever see we're consistently every year we get so depleted on the offensive line. I know that wasn't a regular thing when you were around. Like it, 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 how do you, how do you, how do you, how do you grasp that? Yeah, I, I think I'm trying to remember Back, I remember, I think that was uh, maybe 98 or 90. I remember I got hurt, but that bit, we, we got really depleted, I think, on the other side of the football. I think Daryl yeah. Gardner was up a little bit that, but not like with what, what, what they experienced this year. They lost the interior, which is your core, which is that's what sets the, the, the pocket. So, you know, the tackles run them around. It gives the quarterback chances to, when when that 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 definitely affects. And then I can't remember where we lost all three pass rushes like we like we did. That was like one week. One week, I was like, man, this is this is crazy. And and if you can't put quarter you know pressure on the quarterback, only way you got to do is you got to blitz and this and that. Well, it's going to expose you in some other areas too because now you can't attack a, a offense like you want to. So. It was, you know, I, I take my hat off to him. I, I was frustrated at times because anytime you're a fan, you want to see your team win every week. Yeah. This and that. This, you just try to, you try to remain calm. But it's frustrating because I think what was so frustrating for the fans is everybody could see where we are. We just had to win a couple games, and then we got either home or home field throughout the playoffs. And man, that that's a dream come true. And then to see it slip away like it did, that's what was left a bad taste in everybody's mouth. But I think people stopped really going back and reflecting and said, okay, there were some things that caused that, but you just couldn't see it at the time because they was frustrated and not get it, this and that. But yeah, um, so 
it yeah. should be much better this year. That's 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 my take on it. Yeah. Guys, do me the favor, smash the like button, subscribe if you're new. I appreciate all the donations today because uh, we got demonetized on our video yesterday because of the All-22 XOS Digital, who handles a lot of the college, uh, the university's All-22. Um, they they copy they they struck me for for using um, All-22 clips. So yeah, that that video got demonetized. So hey, with all the effort that goes into doing those big boards, I appreciate all the donations, man. I really do. Um, now. We, we are going to be live tomorrow at 5 p.m. Neil Driscoll is now going to be here with us tomorrow at 5 p.m. So we'll be doing Fin Too Deep at its regular scheduled time. So be out on the lookout for that. We'll have a ton of draft talk and more. Guys, do us a favor. Smash the like button on the way out. Appreciate all of you for joining us here. And as always, you know what time it is. Fin's up all day, every day until Margaritaville sends the cease and desist our way. And it turns into go fins. Take it easy, guys.